Breaking right now at noon, we are about to hear the sentence for ex-gymnastics doctor Larry Nasser. After hearing from more than 150 sex abuse survivors over the past week, the judge will soon give Nasser his prison sentence. Let's go live to the courtroom in Lansing. The assistant attorney general is speaking right now. We also expect to hear from the defense attorney. Then Nasser himself will be given a chance to speak before the sentence is announced. Let's listen in right now. Conduct against numerous young girls. He sexually assaulted them. He did so under the guise of medical treatment, and he did so for his own sexual purpose and gratification. He carried out his plot through a decades-long process he honed and perfected, creating perfect conditions for his predatory behavior. Until these brave women brought it all down. Sentencing, Your Honor, must protect, punish, and deter. <coughs> through your sentence, I ask you to do all three. Judge Aquilina, I ask you to bring these victims the justice they so deserve. We ask you to follow the sentence agreement and sentence the defendant to a minimum of 40 years to at least 125 years in prison or a sentence tail that you see fit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your words. On behalf of the defendant. <laughs> I prepared some remarks today. My client prepared some remarks that he's going to be reading to the court. But I want to start off on some remarks that I have not prepared. This court has provided a foundation for our country to watch our judicial system as it's happening and unfolding. We have a constitution in place. We learn about the constitution when we go to law school. Contrary to what the personal or the perception of uh, Larry's legal team may be, we are all upholding the same document. He has an absolute right to a zealous advocacy. He's got an absolute right to a defense. He has an absolute right to be represented by counsel. And while some may disagree to the way that this case transpired, the conduct of counsel, this is what our Constitution permits. And I can tell you and anybody else listening that unequivocally I would be standing next to this man for every trial that he would hold, every sentencing that he would have, because that's what our Constitution requires. This is not about us. This is not about Larry. This is not about his, his legal team. This is about the victims that were before the court for the last seven days. But I will tell you, the anger and hatred that they expounded on the court is something that Larry saw, we all saw, and we all heard. As we sat in the court this morning, we received an email from somebody who was anonymous that wished death upon our kids for standing next to the man and upholding a constitution, a document and an oath that we took when we all went to law school, whether you're a judge, a defense lawyer, or work for the government. We are doing our jobs. You are doing your job, and the government is doing their job. I would stand by the counsel that we have representing Dr. Nasser, and I would represent Larry again. Now. People ask us all the time if Larry's sorry for what he has done, and others ask what Larry is like while some comment on how he's changed. I'll tell you that Larry is sorry for what he's done, but we realize that these words are completely inconsequential to those that are listening and fall woefully short of an adequate apology to fully address what has transpired. As adults, we understand there are consequences for our actions. Larry's actions have led to an unquantifiable amount of pain. As adults, we should be the only ones who feel pain for our own actions. Sadly, one of the many tragedies in this case is the pain that was articulated these past seven days is not residing with Larry. But instead, and more significantly, it is felt by the hundred plus women who have addressed him, addressed him in court. He is sorry for the hurt that he has caused and he is sorry to each and every one of the individuals who have come before your honor. But an apology is not going to be enough. Sometimes individuals can take solace 
that a small portion of the pain that someone has inflicted on others can be seen in their own appearance and personality. Although it pales in comparison to what we heard these past few days, Larry's soul is broken. He is the shell of a person that we all first met. He is reserved and soft-spoken. His tears are more frequent and our conversations are more somber. As you all know, we sat with Larry these last few days and saw what he saw. He saw the pain, hurt, and anger on your faces. Your words will stay with him and leave an indelible mark on his soul for the remainder of his life. He realizes that what he is feeling is nothing compared to the pain and hurt all of his victims are feeling and were discussed in this courtroom today. I can assure you that your words have pierced his soul and softened his voice. That will never change. I know Larry wants to address the court as well. Sir, please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to provide will be the truth, whole truth, and nothing but the truth under penalty of perjury? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. You need to come up right up to the podium, right to the microphone. What would you like me to know? It's just a short statement. Um, your words these past several days, your words, your words, have had a significant emotional effect on myself and has shaken me to my core. I also recognize that what I am feeling pales in comparison to the pain, trauma, and emotional destruction that all of you are feeling. There are no words that can describe the depth and breadth of how sorry I am for what has occurred. An acceptable apology. Sir, you need to stay at the microphone or they can't hear you. An acceptable apology to all of you is impossible to write and convey. I will carry your words with me for the rest of my days. Sir, I hope that's true. I hope you are shaken to your core. Your victims are clearly shaken to their core. And I know there are still some who ask, are you broken because you got caught? First, let me address counsel. I agree with your words in regard to no one should blame defense counsel and vigilante crime is not tolerated. So I hope that no one will do anything untoward against counsel, their children, their families, their firms, their cars, whatever it is, that is crime. Crime plus crime solves absolutely nothing. Please respect their job. It's a difficult one. I know I've been in their shoes, and the Sixth Amendment does guarantee each defendant the right to counsel. It doesn't matter what the defendant has done, but they have the right to counsel. I also want to say, that being said, we also have the First Amendment. So you are all free to have your own opinions. And it's always a balancing act between the First Amendment, the Sixth Amendment, all of the due process and other counts, amendments to the Constitution. They are all valuable in their own way. And that's why we have an organized and just society, and that's why we are here today, because this defendant has been brought to justice. Do not make it worse, please. Before I get to sentencing, I, I want to talk about a couple of things. And first, I've said what I need to say to the victims. I have a little bit more to say. You are no longer victims. You are survivors. You're very strong, and I've addressed you individually. Before I say anything further, I don't know if you all know this, and I know that the world is watching. I know this because I'm on the bench every day, and this isn't 
the only heinous crime that appears in this court. The National Crime Victimization Survey that's done by the Justice Department annually reports that 310 out of every 1,000 assaults are reported to police, which means that two out of three go unreported. The voices of the survivors have asked everyone, report, keep your voice up. Rachel's voice hopefully will raise these numbers of reports and all of your voices. But that statistic does not include children 12 and under. One in 10 children will be sexually abused by their 18th birthday. One in seven girls, one in 25 boys by their 18th birthday. That means that in the United States, I'm not talking about any other country, but in the United States, 400,000 babies born in the U.S. will become victims of child sexual abuse. It stops now. Speak out like these survivors. Become part of the Army. I do one case at a time. And I really so very much appreciate all of you. Thank yous. I've read some of the Twitters and Facebooks and all of what's going on in the media. I'm not special. I'm doing my job. If you come into my courtroom any Wednesday and watch sentencing, I give everybody a voice. I give defendants a voice, their families when they're here. I give victims a voice. I try to treat everybody like family because that's the justice system that I was raised to believe in. I came to this country stateless. I'm naturalized. My father's Maltese, my mother's German, and I was raised on old country values. And my grandmother always told me, and my parents always told me, my grandfather too, that America is the greatest country. I believe that. That's why I served in the military. That's why I've always done community service. I'm not really well liked because I speak out. I don't have many friends because I speak out. If you ask me a question, you better be ready for the answer. I speak out because I want change because I don't believe in hiding the truth, and I'm not saying I'm always right, but I try. I also don't believe that one size fits all when it comes to sentencing. Another reason I listen. I know that there are some judges for every crime that give the same punishment. I don't think that's justice. I believe in individualized sentencing. I follow the Constitution, and I believe our system works. I also believe these survivors. Now, there's case law about how I can consider what I can consider. And first and foremost, my sentence reflects the seven in regard to who defendant pled to. But the remainder of you, the 161 others, add to the credibility of those seven. So technically I'm considering everything, everyone. Because your crime, all of your crimes, the depth of them have cut into the core of this community and many communities and all of the families and people we don't even know. And sir, 
the media has asked me to release your letter. I'm not going to do that. Council may object, the media may object, but there is some information in here that troubles me in regard to the victims. And I don't want them re-victimized by the words that you have in here. But I do want to read some more of your letter. And the reason I want to do that is because I've considered it in sentencing as an, extent, as an extension of your apology and whether I believe it or not. So I want you to hear your words. I've already read some and I'm not reading every line. Well, let me begin. The federal judge went ballistic at sentencing since I pled guilty to the state cases and spent 10% on the federal case and 90% on the state cases and civil suits. She gave me 60 years instead of 5 to 20 years, in parentheses, three consecutive 20-year sentences. I pleaded guilty to possession of porn from 9, 2004 to 12, 2004, four months. The prosecutor even admitted that I never belonged to any porn sites, any chat rooms, was not on the dark web, and also they could not prove I viewed it. It was all deleted, of course. I shared my electronics, and I could not prove that. So for four months of porn possession from 2004, I was sentenced to 60 years. Not proper, appropriate, fair. Going down a few lines. <laughs> What I did in the state cases was medical, not sexual. But because of the porn, I lost all support, thus another reason for the state guilty plea. Let me move down further. So I tried to avoid a trial to save the stress to this community, my family, the victims. Yet look what is happening. It is wrong. Let me move down further. I was a good doctor because my treatments worked and those patients that are now speaking out were the same ones that praised and came back over and over and referred family and friends to see me. The media convinced them that everything I did was wrong and bad. They feel I broke their trust. Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. Oh. It is just a complete nightmare. The stories that are being fabricated to sensationalize this, then the AG would only accept my plea if I said what I did was not medical and was for my own pleasure. They forced me to say that or they were going to trial and not accepting the plea, I wanted to plead no contest, but the AG refused that. I was so manipulated by the AG, and now Aquilina, and all I wanted was to minimize stress to everyone, like I wrote earlier. Going down a little bit further. In addition, with the federal case, 
My medical treatments with the Olympic slash national team gymnastics were discussed as part of the plea. The FBI investigated them in 2015 and found nothing substantial because it was medical. Now they are seeking the media attention and financial reward. Would you like to withdraw your plea? No, Your Honor. Because you are guilty, aren't you? Are you guilty, sir? I said my plea, exactly. The new sign language has become treatment. These quotes, these air quotes, I will never see them again without thinking of you and your despicable acts. I don't care how they're used, I will always think of quotes and the word treatment. It was not treatment, what you did. It was not medical. There is no medical evidence that was ever brought. When this case first came to me, and I've told you this, and I apologize to the Olympians and athletes, but I have five children, two dogs. My parents live with me. I work four jobs. I don't have much time for television. I don't watch sports. Although last year I was a soccer coach, much to the <coughs> laughter of my family. <laughs> I didn't know anything about you, or your name, or anything that was going on. And so when I kept saying, we're going to trial, here's the date, and everyone wanted more time, I said, no, nope, here's the cutoff. And then the cases were merged and we delayed it. And I still thought, well, maybe there's a defense of medical treatment. And why did I think that? Because it's my job to be fair and impartial, but also because my two brothers and my father are very well known and respected doctors real doctors with real treatments and research dedicated to healing. I haven't considered that in this case, but I have heard from your survivors now that they trust doctors like I trust the doctors in my family and the doctors I go to. But I still thought, well, there's a defense of medical treatment, and there are changes in the medical community every day for the betterment. So up until the time you fled, I believed that maybe there was a defense here, despite the felony information. I was ready for trial. Your counsel was ready for trial. The Attorney General's office was ready for trial. You, sir, decided to plead because there was no medical treatment. You did this for your pleasure and your control. This letter, which comes two months after your plea, tells me that you have not yet owned what you did, that you still think that somehow you are right, that you are a doctor, that you're entitled, that you don't have to listen, and that you did treatment. I wouldn't send my dogs to you, sir. There's no treatment here. You finally told the truth. Inaction is an action. Silence is indifference. Justice requires action and a voice, and that is what has happened here in this court. 168 buckets of water were placed on your so-called match. 
that got out of control. I also, like law enforcement, or like the Attorney General, want to thank law enforcement for their investigation, but I also want to be the voice on behalf of the survivors who asks law enforcement to continue their fine work and to also include the federal government. There has to be a massive investigation as to why there was inaction, why there was silence. Justice requires more than what I can do on this bench. I want to also applaud all of the counsel in the Attorney General's office. I want to also applaud Defense Counsel. You all have done fine work. You've made me proud of our legal system. We all work together for the betterment of our community, and that is law enforcement, prosecutors, defense counsel, investigators. There are countless people. It's the only way our system works. We need this balance. So all of you, when I look at myself as Lady Justice, my arms are like this. They are balanced. Prosecution, defense are balanced. It only starts to tip after there's a plea and after I take into consideration everything that's happened. So I want everyone to understand <coughs> I've also done my homework. I always do. People versus Wakalowski, I'm sure I slaughtered the name, I apologize, but it is spelled W-A-C-L-A-W-S-K-I. 286 Mishaf 634, it's a 2009 case. <coughs> and in it, and I want you to clearly understand, it says, plainly, the law does not limit victims' impact statements to direct victims. It doesn't say, and I have found nowhere that limits me from having you hear all of your victims. As I said before, when counsel came to me and said, we're not going to go to trial, despite our court having already sent out 200 of the 800 juror requests. And they told me their plea, and would I consider it in lieu of trial? There was the agreement between us because I always, and they know it, they are familiar with me, let people speak. And I wanted all victims. And we had a discussion about which victims. And of course, there was an objection to one of them. I let it come in anyway. That was part of the plea that you entered into to allow the victim impact statements. Because after that discussion, I know your lawyers, as good as they are, sat down with you and said, the judge is going to allow this. And when it comes down to it, I know it also because this was signed by the Attorney General, by defendant, and by defendant's counsel on November 22, 2017. that you wrote a couple of months after your plea, which tells me you still don't get it. There's something I don't understand and I want to make clear. 
Sir, you knew you had a problem. That is clear to me. You knew you had a problem from a very young age, even before you were a doctor. You could have taken yourself away from temptation. And you did not. But worse yet, there isn't a survivor who hasn't come in here and said how world-renowned you were. I trust what they say. You could have gone anywhere in the world to be treated. You could have gone to any resort, any doctor place where you could get treatment in Europe. They have all sorts of hidden places for things like this. No one had to know and you could have found some treatment, some help, taken some medicine. You would have done that if you had cancer. I know you would have. You're about self-preservation. But you decided to not address what's inside you that causes this control urge, that causes you to be a sexual predator. So your urge is escalated, and based on the numbers that we all know go unreported, I can't even guess how many vulnerable children and families you actually assaulted. <coughs> Your decision to assault was precise, calculated, manipulative, devious, despicable. I don't have to add words because your survivors have said all of that. I don't want to repeat it. You can't give them back their innocence, their youth. You can't give a father back his life or one of your victims her life when she took it. You can't return the daughter to the mother, the father to the daughter. You played on everyone's vulnerability. I'm not vulnerable. Not to you. Not to other criminals at that podium. I swore to uphold the Constitution and the law, and I am well trained. I know exactly what to do. And at this time, I'm going to do it. And I want you to know as much as it was my honor and privilege to hear the sister survivors, it is my honor and privilege to sentence you. Because, sir, you do not deserve to walk outside of a prison ever again. You have done nothing to control those urges, and anywhere you walk, destruction will occur to those most vulnerable. Now I am honoring the agreement. I'm also honoring what's been requested of me. And I want you to know, I'm not good at math. I have a cheat sheet. I'm only a lawyer. I know that you have a lot of education in physics and math. But I have a cheat sheet. It is my privilege on count one, two, five, eight, ten, and eighteen. And 24. To sentence you to 40 years. And when I look at my cheat sheet, 
40 years, just so you know and you can count it off your calendar, is 480 months. The tail end, because I need to send a message to the parole board in the event, somehow God is gracious, and I know he is. And you survived the 60 years in federal court first, and then you started my 40 years? You've gone off the page here as to what I'm doing. My page only goes 200 years. Sir, I'm giving you 175 years, which is 2,100 months. I just signed your death warrant. I I need everyone to be quiet. I sell contempt powers. I told you I'm not nice. <laughs> I find that you don't get it, that you're a danger. You remain a danger. I'm a judge who believes in life and rehabilitation when rehabilitation is possible. I have many defendants come back here and show me the great things they've done in their lives after probation, after parole. I don't find that's possible with you. So, you will receive jail credit on counts 1, 2, 5, 8, 10, and 18 of 369 days. On count 24, you will have 370 days jail credit if you are ever out, which is doubtful you would be required to register with the Michigan Sex Offenders Registration Act, comply with all of the requirements of that act, in addition to global position monitoring system, you would wear a GPS. You will pay restitution in the amount to be determined based on whatever amounts are Submitted, and your attorneys can ask me for a restitution hearing so that I can determine what a reasonable amount is for the victim. I am leaving restitution open as long as those victims have issues that can be medically documented. You will comply with DNA testing and pay a $60 fee for that. I suspect that was already done, but you owe $60 back to the county for that or law enforcement, whoever, will put it in the right pocket. You must submit to HIV testing and complete counseling associated with HIV and AIDS. You must waive confidentiality and allow test results and medical information obtained from this test to be released to the court. You will pay $476 in state costs. You will pay a crime victim's assessment the amount of $130. Council wish to address court costs and fines. I don't know his financial state. Judge, he doesn't have any money to pay any court costs and fines. If the court wants to impose it, the court can impose it. I'm not imposing any court costs and fines, and here's the reason. I don't know what he has or what he'll get in the future. The victims deserve the money. The county will survive one way or another. I'm also going to make recommendations to the Michigan Department of Corrections for mental health treatment. Health treatment, I understand he has some medical conditions and he should be allowed to take medicine for that. He should have individual and group counseling, treatment for sexual predators, whatever they allow. I'm also going to send a message, I'm not sure, but I believe I read an article Sir, that you were treating people in prison that don't have a license, don't commit any more crimes. I know you don't have any more lives to give, but you can't be treating people. You're not a doctor. So I'm not sure how that's happening. But I wanted to send that message. You have 21 days to appeal, 10 days to request court-appointed counsel. Do you acknowledge receipt of your appellate rights? Your Honor, I've got the notice of right to appeal, and I'm providing it to my client now. Do you acknowledge it? 
Yes, Robert. Thank you. So let me just say to the media, again, I'm just doing my job. I know you all want to talk to me. My secretary has informed me that I have a growing stack of requests from print media, from television, from magazines, from around the world, literally. This story is not about me. It never was about me. I hope I've opened some doors, but you see, I'm a little stupid because I thought everybody did what I did. And if they didn't, maybe they ought to, but I do this and have been doing it. And if you don't believe me, the keeper of my words is right by my side, and lawyers who are hearing this are shaking their heads saying, yep, I've waited too long as she lets everybody talk. Sometimes people get upset. I don't care, I get paid the same. So as to the media who want to talk with me, I'm not going to be making any statements. I know that my office, and I may have even, I don't know, been a long couple of weeks conveyed that after this is over. It's just not my story. After the appellate period runs, with victims by my side to tell their stories, I might answer some more questions than what I said on the record. I don't know what more I could possibly say. But I'm not going to talk with any media person until after the appeal period, and even then, if you talk to me about this case, I will have a survivor with me because it is their story. So I wanted everybody to hear that from me. I respect all of the media outlets. You have done just a fabulous job here. There hasn't been any commotion or upset by this, and I do believe in the First Amendment, so I thank you all for being here because it's an important story for the survivors. As to today, I know that there are a lot of survivors, family members, husbands, friends, a lot of people in the courtroom. You have voices. I'm going to leave the courtroom. Defendant will leave the courtroom. The attorneys may stay. Victims, family members, survivors. <coughs> you may stay in the courtroom and talk with media. You can have your own press conference right here. Spur of the moment sometimes works out the best, doesn't it? <laughs> again, I won't make a statement until after the appeal period. And again, if there's any survivor then who, at that point, if somebody wants to talk to me, I'm sure you'll be moved on to another story. But if you're not, please give your names to uh, the victim's advocate so that I can contact you because please, media, do not contact me on this story without a survivor. It's their story. I thank everybody in this case. Sir, I hope somewhere you have heard everybody's words and it really does resonate with you. Anything else for the record? <coughs> Oh, I'm sorry. Nothing but half. Uh, no, you're right. All right. So the media is asked to stay here with all those lovely people who may want to speak with you. Thank you. That's all for the record. All right. A lot of emotion happening in a Lansing courtroom today. 
The sentence handed down in the Larry Nasser case, the former MSU doctor and USA Gymnastics doctor, sentenced to a minimum of 40 years in prison, up to 175 years behind bars. That is in addition to and served after the 60 years that he received for a child pornography uh, charge and conviction. We, of course, are standing by live. A lot of people have been waiting. The judge had a lot to say in this situation. She's saying to Nasser directly that he knew he had a problem, and he never made any attempts to stop being a sexual predator for decades. We have been following this case for several, several days now. We have seen over 150 survivors say their piece directly to Larry Nasser and what their life has been like, and they were speaking out, many showing a lot of courage, the judge recognizing that. Our 24-hour news aides, Heather Walker, is at the courthouse in Lansing. She, of course, will be standing by to give us an up-close look at what's happening there right now. A lot of people hugging. You can see there's a lot of emotion. One thing we did not see over the last seven days, which was a lot of reaction from Larry Nasser himself. He remained in his chair. He looked the same primarily most of the sentencing hearing. He did issue a letter that the judge read excerpts of when he said that he was hoping that what he called a media circus would end. He wanted the judge to stop allowing survivors to speak with him at the podium. He thought that and accused her of in that letter that she was trying to gain attention from this and it is what he described as a media circus she read excerpts of that letter back to him using that as an example if you will of how he really still has not completely grasped the magnitude of how he affected so many women for so many years 24-hour news aides heather walker is standing by in the courtroom. She has more on the reaction of what's happening there right now. Heather, what was it like in the courtroom when she made that sentence? What was the reaction? Okay, so right now we are just inside the courtroom where you can see people are crying. It's emotional. There's lots of hugging going on right now. It's bittersweet for a lot of these victims who have been going through this. We're going to try to go and um, talk to the woman that started this all. Her name is Rachel. She was the one that did the interview with the Indy Star. And uh, hi there. What are your emotions and thoughts right now? I'm, just, I'm grateful. I'm grateful for where we are, especially given where we started. It is incredible to see what's happening. Did you ever think that this would come out of you speaking out in an interview? You know, I hoped it would. I really did. The number of victims that Larry had was not a secret. You know, something he did regularly. But I could not have anticipated this many survivors being willing to speak. It's incredible. What was the feeling in here? There's, there's a lot of grief, but it's mixed with a lot of victory. I think victory is a good word for it. And what message do you hope that the world, I mean, everyone has been watching this across the country, across the world. What, what message do you hope that people get from this? Do it better next time. Do it better the next time. You still have a lot of questions for uh, <laughs> MSU. Yes, I do. And USAG both. Yes, I do. Does this give you hope that you're going to get more of those answers? I, I hope so. It's the, it's the biggest sexual assault scandal in history, and we should want to know why it happened. And Rachel. if we don't, it's not going to get better. When you first started this process back in August of 2016, did you ever think that you would get to this point, and did you think it would turn into what it did? You know, again, the number of sexual assault victims that we had was plain to me. Whether or not anyone would feel safe enough to come forward, that was the wild part. Was there ever a moment where you had to step back and say, oh my gosh, there really are this many victims, or did you kind of know to die? I knew. Because that's how pedophiles operate. That's how pedophiles operate, and that is why I was convinced, even at 15, that there was no way someone hadn't spoken of it. There was no way. 175 years, the right sentence? Absolutely. I'm very grateful for Judge Ackerman and the leadership she showed for all of us. 
Do you think the justice was in this courtroom when he spoke, when everybody spoke in front of him, more justice than prison itself? I think there is definitely a dynamic to that, to have to sit and listen, you know, but there is, there is not a lot that we can do for Larry at this point. Whether he takes our words to heart is not up to us, but being able to speak them is where the power is. What did you think about what he said in court today? In the letter that the judge read talking about being manipulated. I think Larry is a master manipulator, and we saw further evidence of that today. Well, what about the letter and how it stated how, you know, he felt manipulated by the AG's office and how this was a, quote, nightmare for him and the judge saying that he doesn't get it. Do you think that he gets it? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Larry is a master manipulator, and we saw more evidence of that today. That is, that is how pedophiles work. That is how predators work. It shouldn't be a surprise. What do you hope to What's get from MSU now? Do you think anything will come? Do they need to take responsibility for what happened under their watch? Do you think that they understand? Okay, you have been listening to live reaction. This is uh, the young lady that we spoke with, a Kalamazoo native that originally went forward with the accusations against Larry Nasser and spoke at his sentencing. You know, it started out with only about uh, less than 100, not only, but less than 100 women going to speak their mind and say what they had to say to Larry Nasser. It ended with over 150 women speaking out during the sentencing trial. You can see there's a lot of uh, pandemonium in the courtroom right now, a lot of people talking about that sentence that was handed down, a minimum of 40 years, maximum of 175, added on to the 60 that he's already going to serve. Larry Nasser has been sentenced today. We will have updates throughout the day at woodtv.com, and we will have more, of course, full coverage tonight on your 24-hour news 8 at 5 and 6 o'clock. Heather Walker is going to be talking with some people, and she will have the very latest for us throughout the day.